Today, we're traveling through time and space to uncover the moments when Canadian inventions, people and ideas completely and quietly changed the world we live in today. Canada doesn't always shout about its achievements, but when it moves, the world moves with it. Our first travel takes us to 1999, deep underground. To be precise, two kilometers below the surface of northern Ontario, inside a working nickel mine near Sudbury. It's dark and completely silent. Researchers describe it as one of the quietest places on Earth because it's shielded from cosmic radiation and external noise by way too much rock. Here, scientists built a glowing sphere this size of a small house, filled with 1,000 tons of heavy water. It's water made with a heavier form of hydrogen and surrounded by thousands of sensors, all waiting to detect something that passes through everything – neutrinos. They are tiny and nearly invisible particles created by nuclear reactions in the cores of stars like the Sun and inside nuclear plants and even during radioactive decay on Earth. In fact, every second, billions of them pass through our body. They don't stop, they don't collide. They just go through us and the Earth like ghosts. Let's go back to the 1960s for a second. This is important to understand why the Sudbury Observatory is such a big deal. Back then, scientists first built detectors to catch solar neutrinos, particles made by the Sun's fusion reactions. But when they counted them, half were missing. And that was a big deal, because if the math was right, something was wrong with the Sun, or with our understanding of physics itself. Obviously, it was the latter. The mystery of the solar neutrino problem haunted physicists for decades, until 1990s. That's when the team of Canadian and international scientists, led by Dr. Arthur MacDonald from Queen's University, built the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, two kilometers underground, to block all other radiation to hopefully gain precision. Finally, they found the answer. The neutrinos weren't missing, they were changing as they traveled, and that's why it looked like half of them were missing back in the 1960s. Turns out, neutrinos come in three flavors, and they can switch between them as they travel through space, and even through matter. They oscillate or change the flavor, as they call it. That realization meant neutrinos must have mass, real physical weight. That was groundbreaking and changed physics forever. This discovery paved the way for more precise hospital scanning technology and nuclear safety technology. It also helped us better understand the universe. Suddenly, part of the mystery of the universe's missing matter started to make sense. They are light, but there are so many of them that together they weigh as much as all the stars in the universe combined. In 2015, Arthur MacDonald received the Nobel Prize in Physics for this discovery, shared with Takaaki Kajita in Japan, who confirmed it. It was one of the many moments when quiet Canadian science changed history, but they didn't do it alone. It was also an example of international collaboration, including American and British scientists. Today, that same lab is now called Snow Lab and continues exploring cosmic mysteries like dark matter, supernovae, and the origins of the universe itself. If you want to stay tuned, you can follow them on Instagram or subscribe for updates on their website, or even take a virtual tour. Now, let's rewind further in time to the 1870s. In Canada, the railways are expanding westward, towns are springing up, schedules matter more than ever, but there is a tiny issue. Each town uses local time, when the sun reaches its peak. So in one town it might be 12 o'clock, and in another nearby town it might already be 12.20. This is obviously chaos for any sort of coordination, let alone train schedule coordination. Sanford Fleming, a railway engineer by trade, experiences it firsthand. One story goes that he missed a train because of the schedule confusion tied to the inconsistent times. And that frustration led him to ask, what if the world agreed on something better? That's how, in 1879, he formally proposed a system dividing the world into 24 time zones, each one hour apart, and linking that to a standard meridian. At the 1884 International Meridian Conference, his ideas were adopted, and over subsequent decades, the world gradually synchronized. Suddenly, you didn't need to ask what time it was there, it was all mapped and known. 
every flight, every call across time zones and every international business meeting runs on that framework now. And it started with a Canadian who thought schedules needed global order. I would think it's a German who'd come up with this sort of thing. But now it was a Scottish Canadian. Now let's shift to the early 1940s. The world is at war. And in quiet offices across Canada, scientists are working on something few people will ever hear about. Among them was a man from Winnipeg, William Stevenson, codenamed Intrepid. He helped establish Camp X, a secret training base in Ontario, where agents learned radio interception, sabotage and covert operations. From there, Stevenson's reach extended far beyond Canada. He moved to New York as head of Britain's Western Hemisphere Intelligence, the British Security Coordination. From an unassuming office in Rockefeller Center, he built networks of spies, he coordinated propaganda and served as the vital link between Churchill and Roosevelt. It's hard to imagine now, but the Allies were losing ground back in the day. Hitler's forces seemed unstoppable, communications were fragile, and code systems were primitive. Stevenson and his Canadian-trained agents quietly changed that, embedding intelligent networks across the Americas, advancing encryption, and defining new standards for clandestine warfare. Many of the modern intelligence methods, from special operations training to signals warfare, all that traces back to those very facilities in Ontario. And to this day, Ontario remains one of the Canada's key hubs for signals intelligence. The Second World War was the first war that wasn't won by soldiers alone. In many cases, balance shifted in windowless offices and underground bunkers. And one of those was run by a Canadian spy. Sir William Stevenson was so influential that he is often cited as one of the real-life inspirations for James Bond. There are some records stating that Ian Fleming himself wrote that James Bond is a highly romanticized version of a true spy. The real thing is William Stevenson. The exact quote attribution is not fully verifiable, but hey, they kinda look alike, right? Now let's travel in time and also dig inside the Earth in the 1960s. Half a century earlier, Alfred Wegener had proposed the idea of continental drift. But most geologists still struggled with it. The idea that continents could move sounded plausible, yet no one could really explain how, why, or by which mechanisms. After all, the Earth's crust appeared rigid and immovable. And here comes J. Tuzo Wilson, a Canadian geophysicist. He noticed something odd. In places like Hawaii, volcanic islands line up in a chain, big and active at one end, and smaller and extinct at the other. Earthquakes seemed to follow similar invisible lines. Wilson realized that these weren't random. He proposed the idea of hotspots. Then he introduced another key idea, transform faults. These discoveries tied everything together. Wilson showed that Earth's crust isn't a solid shell, it's broken into moving plates. Today, every time you hear that tectonic plates move just a few inches a year, or you see a news report about earthquakes along the San Andreas Fault, that's all part of the legacy of one Canadian scientist who simply looked at the Earth and asked, how does all of that fit together? It's thanks to his work that we now understand that our planet isn't static. It's alive, it's shifting beneath our feet, slowly reshaping everything that we know. Let's move to a quiet lab in Toronto in the early 1960s. Two scientists, Till and McCullough, are working on mice and bone marrow transplants. They conduct radiation experiments and one day they observe something remarkable. Certain bone marrow cells in mice can divide again and again, forming colonies and replenishing blood cells. They published their landmark work in 1961, showing the existence of multipotent stem cells in mammals. These are the cells that can turn into different types of blood cells. Why was this such a big thing? Well, because it proved that the body has a built-in repair system, tiny cells that can regenerate and heal. Before this, the idea of regeneration in mammals was very vague. Doctors treated disease, replaced organs if needed, but the notion of a cell that could become many types and regenerate tissue was still unconventional. Till and McCullough changed that. This opened the door to bone marrow transplants, regenerative medicine, and gene therapy. Today's lab-grown tissues, 
stem cell trials and regenerative oncology all walk down the path that James Steele and Ernest McCullough have carved. Their contribution was subtle, but life-changing, literally. But their contributions didn't just stop there. Till and McCullough then expanded their research activities and mentored other young scientists, who later became pioneers in human genetics, immunology, and cancer treatment. Okay, we're coming back to the 1990s now, the era of the best pop music and rising anxiety about the environment. Back then, not everyone was convinced that the atmosphere could change. Some people doubted whether the ozone layer was even thinning. After all, it's invisible, and life on the surface seemed normal. All good, right? But then the data started piling up. Satellites showed a giant ozone hole over Antarctica. Dermatologists reported rising skin cancer rates. Pilots noticed stronger UV glare at high altitudes. The evidence wasn't a theory anymore. It was measurable, visible, and showing up in people's lives. The ozone layer, that thin blue shield protecting us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation, was indeed weakening. So the question became, how do you warn people about something that they can't even see until it's too late? That question landed on the desks of a small team of Canadian scientists at Environment Canada, now known as Environment and Climate Change Canada. These guys decided to turn invisible danger into something that everyone could understand. The idea came from two Canadian atmospheric scientists, Dr. James B. Kerr, a physicist based in Toronto, and Dr. C.T. McElroy, working in Montreal. Both were veterans in ozone radiation research, measuring UV intensity from ground-based spectrophotometers and balloons. They realized that they were sitting on data that could literally save lives but it was locked in academic papers and graphs that nobody outside a lab could interpret. So, in 1992, Kerr McElroy, working with the Environment Canada's Atmospheric Environment Service, developed a simple scale, the Ultraviolet Index, or UV Index. It was a single number, typically from 0 to 11, translating complex radiation doses into something that everyone could use. And just like that, science became everyday life. Before that, people would wear sunscreen reactively and they didn't know why, when, or how much of what type they should put on. They would usually start wearing it after they already got burned. The UV index changed that. Now we can predict risk. All you need to do is just open up an app on your phone, check the UV index, and plan your outdoor activities accordingly. And understand the invisible effects of UV radiation on skin and your eyes. Canada, in fact, became the first country in the world to broadcast the UV index nationally through daily weather reports. Today, all weather apps around the world show the UV index number. And that helps us decide whether we need just a hat, a sunscreen, or better just not show up on the sun at all. Public health campaigns rely on this number. The World Health Organization and World Meteorological Organization adopted it globally. What began as a Canadian innovation became a universal tool. It started quietly here in Canada and ended up protecting billions of people every single day. We all know that insulin was discovered in Canada, but what's often forgotten is how the discovery turned into one of the most generous acts in the history of medicine. Because it's not just the story of science, it's the story of values. Let's travel back to Toronto in 1921. A young doctor named Frederick Banting, with the help of a medical student, Charles Best, managed to isolate insulin, a hormone that could control blood sugar levels in diabetic patients. Before that, a diabetes diagnosis was a slow, certain death sentence. There were no treatments, no hope, only starvation diets that delayed the inevitable. But within months of their discovery at the University of Toronto, patients who had been days from death began recovering. It was, without exaggeration, a medical miracle. By 1922, the world was desperate to get access to this liquid gold. Pharmaceutical companies saw enormous profit potential. But Banting, Best, and their research director, John McLeod, among with chemist James Collip, believed insulin should never belong to a corporation. They wanted it to belong to humanity. So in 1923, the three inventors made a radical choice. They sold the patent for the insulin to the University of Toronto for one dollar each. Banting famously said, insulin does not belong to me, it belongs to the world. That decision changed everything. By transferring the rights to the university, they ensured that no single company could monopolize insulin production. The university set up partnerships with pharmaceutical firms under strict conditions. 
They could manufacture insulin, but only if they followed standardized, quality-controlled, affordable production methods. For the first time in history, a medical breakthrough was shared internationally, not sold. Factories from Toronto to London to New York began producing insulin at cost. Within just a few years, thousands of hospitals around the world had reliable access to it. It became the first globally standardized life-saving drug, setting the blueprint for how public institutions and private industry could collaborate for humanity's benefit. Nearly a century later, that one decision still echoes. Hundreds of millions of people have lived normal lives because of insulin. And every time a diabetic person reaches for their injection pen or pump, they're holding a small piece of Canadian history, a reminder that science can be both brilliant and selfless. The discovery of insulin wasn't only a triumph of medicine, but a triumph of humanity. That's where the real legacy is. The idea that life-saving knowledge should serve everyone, not just those who can afford it. That's a lesson the world still needs today, and one that was born quietly in a University of Toronto lab in 1923. So there you have it. Seven Canadian moments of quiet power, subtle change, but very big impact. Which one of these surprised you the most? Tell us in the comments and let us know what we've missed. These are just few of countless times that Canadians changed the world forever. If you liked this journey through time and space, make sure to hit the like button below and subscribe to this channel for more information like this. And I'll see you in the next video right there. Take care.